Hello everyone and welcome back to Biology with Mrs. Evans. Today we're going to look at Darwin's theory of evolution. So Darwin's theory of evolution basically has four major parts to it. First, genetic differences. Uh, there are differences within a population uh, because of different genes. We know about uh, different forms of an allele. So there are genetic differences in a population. Those differences are what nature is basically going to choose uh, based on the environment. So environmental challenges. There are um, environmental conditions that organisms need to overcome in order to survive. And those organisms that have the traits that are better suited for that environment are the, the ones that are going to survive because they're the ones that are surviving. They're going to reproduce and they're going to pass those traits on to their offspring. So over time, uh, the organisms are going to evolve uh, as a population. So over reproduction, again, this is using Mathis's idea that organisms create lots of offspring uh, in order to increase the chance that at least one or a couple will survive um, basically in the environment. And then the last part is future success. So those individuals that have those traits that are favored are going to uh, reproduce, create more individuals that have those traits, and they're going to uh, basically continue to be selected uh, by the environment. And we're going to look about uh, we're going to look at each of these uh, in a moment. So genetic differences. So again, organisms in a population have uh, differences. Uh, in the population. So here is a population of giraffes. Notice all of the differences uh, in the different population. So nature would choose, uh, let's say, this particular giraffe maybe because uh, the environment was dark um, as opposed to uh, this giraffe, which would basically be uh, easily spotted. So there's differences in a population. Uh, that's the first tenet of Darwin's theory of evolution. The second is environmental challenges. So organisms um, are exposed to environments that basically uh, create challenges that they must overcome. So here is a crocodile about ready to eat a wildebeest. So this wildebeest has very strong muscles and is able to jump and get away uh, from the crocodile. But let's say this wildebeest does not have very strong leg muscles, so it isn't able to jump. So what happens is, is the crocodile uh, isn't able to eat this one, so this one gets eaten, and this one, because it survived, is now able to reproduce, and it's going to create uh, other organisms that uh, would have the ability basically to jump. So this one, eventually, um, those that have these traits are going to die out because the crocodile is able to eat them. And then uh, this wildebeest is going to survive and create other wildebeests that would have those very strong leg muscles uh, to get away. Over reproduction. So again, by creating lots of offspring, uh, you increase the chances that some of them will survive. So Again, Mathis said that as population size increases, there becomes limited resources, so you start to compete uh, for those resources. So here's a picture of uh, probably a thousand tadpoles. So by creating a thousand tadpoles and all the variations that you would see in a tadpole, hopefully one or two or maybe even five of these tadpoles would have the traits that are necessary to survive in this given environment. So the huge production of offspring would increase the likelihood that a couple of them uh, would survive. Future success. So again, offspring that have the genes that are better suited for an environment are going to survive and reproduce. So eventually you see a shift uh, in the offspring. So for example, here is the uh, scene that you see here. So you notice there are some genetic differences. You have green beetles and you have uh, orange beetles. So the green beetles, let's say, uh, taste better or are more easily spotted by uh, this bird. So you notice that uh, in the second generation or a couple of generations later, you see that there are more orange beetles, right? Because these are the beetles that uh, have a trait that uh, the bird doesn't like. Let's say, as I said up there, uh, the green beetles, 
uh, green beetles taste better. So the orange ones, they don't like them, so uh, they survive and they reproduce and they create more orange beetles. The green beetles, their numbers are reducing or getting lower because they're being eaten uh, by the bird. So a couple of generations later, let's say um, 15 generations later, all you see is the orange beetles because the green beetles basically have been selected against uh, by the birds. So the orange ones flourish and the green, the green ones uh, basically disappear uh, from the earth because they got eaten uh, by the bird. So fitness and adaptations. These are two ideas that uh, are a big piece of uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. So adaptations are basically uh, things that an organism have that increases their chance of survival. For example, um, an owl has a curved beak so it can rip uh, the flesh of uh, prey that it has gotten. It has strong talons so that it can capture a bunny rabbit that's hopping. All right, those are all adaptations, physical um, traits that they have. It could be behavioral traits that they have, anything that increases basically uh, their chance of survival. And then fitness is um, the ability to survive in an environment and also the ability to reproduce. So an organism, let's say, that is 90 years old but has only reproduced one offspring is going to be less less fit than an organism that, say, that's 85 years old and has had hundreds of offspring. So fitness is the ability to survive and reproduce. And then adaptations, again, uh, something that benefits the uh, organism so that it is or increases uh, its ability to survive. So adaptations, again, like I said, they can be uh, anatomical, they can be physiological, or they can be behavioral. An example of an adaptation that is behavioral would be uh, birds that migrate uh, in order to get away from the cold. Uh, they migrate down south uh, to basically weather out the colder months. Notice here, um, I don't know if you can see it or not, but this is a toad that has basically camouflage that increases its ability uh, to blend in and ultimately it increases its fitness because it has the ability uh, to blend in and, and hopefully survive. So adaptations an owl has, again, um, you guys can probably uh, pause the video and list some of these adaptations and we'll go over some of these adaptations uh, in class. So evolution versus natural selection, they are not the same thing, all right? Evolution is the end result of basically uh, natural selection and the uh, how it chooses, how nature chooses for traits. So you need to know, you need to be able to compare and contrast natural selection and evolution. Evolution is what happens to a population. Uh, populations change over time, usually thousands of years. Uh, it results in basically genetic adaptations that um, nature chooses and then, uh, again, it occurs very slowly. Natural selection happens to individual. Nature chooses the traits that an individual has, um, and those individuals survive and reproduce. Uh, this happens quickly because it's happening on an individual level. Um, and again, it determines whether an organism has those traits and survives and then reproduces uh, to pass those traits on. So note Natural selection and evolution are not the same thing. Natural selection is the driving force, uh, basically, behind evolution. Rate of evolution. Rate of evolution typically uh, is a very slow process, uh, but there are certain factors that can uh, speed it up. For example, uh, the speed at which an organism reproduces. Um, bacteria, we talked about that. Bacteria are organisms that can reproduce very quickly. You can start with one bacteria cell and within 24 hours you can end up with a billion different cells. Because they reproduce so quickly, they can evolve quickly. So bacteria that is re um, resistant to antibiotics, those bacteria survive, they reproduce. So uh, the speed of evolution for them is uh, relatively quickly because of how quickly uh, they reproduce. Organisms that reproduce slower, again, the process is going to be much slower. The second thing that can impact the rate of evolution is harsh environments. Uh, 
harsh environments can lead to a faster pace of evolution because there is stress put on the organism to overcome uh, those harsh environments. Um, if you're not stressed or there's no pressure in order for you to basically survive, then you're not going to develop those features that would cause you to survive. So being exposed to very harsh environments puts pressures on organisms to develop those adaptations that would help them uh, survive. So I will tell you now, that is going to be a short answer question on your test. Uh, describe the two things that can basically impact the rate of evolution. So one is uh, the speed of re reproduction. If an organism reproduces quickly, like in bacteria, then the speed of evolution is also uh, quick. And then harsh environments put pressure on an organism basically to adapt to those environments. Evidence for evolution. So there is lots and lots of ev uh, evidence that scientists use to support the idea of evolution. Obviously in earth science you talked about fossils and uh, how those are used. Um, geographic location of those fossils are also used to support the idea of evolution. DNA evidence uh, is also used and we're going to look at that in a lab specifically is how uh, we can use DNA to uh, show uh, basically uh, that organisms have basically come from a common ancestor. Uh, embryology and anatomy. Embryology is the study of embryos, and we're going to look at that in a moment. And then anatomy is looking at the anatomy of an organism and saying that, yes, uh, these organisms have similar features, so chances are they were probably related. So fossil evidence. So if you look at the fossil record, and the fossil record is simply an index of all the fossils that are ever found on Earth, uh, you can see how organisms have uh, changed over time. And you're going to see this in a lab that we're going to do in class. If you had me for our science, you did this lab as well. Um, it shows you how an organism basically could have changed uh, over time. Uh, in Earth's history. So fossils are used to support the idea of how a different, how a species could have evolved um, over time. Age of fossils. This is a review. This is something that you should have learned in Earth science. There are two ways that scientists basically determine the age of a fossil. One is relative dating. This is something, again, that you learned in Earth science. And relative dating is basically using index fossils to help you identify the age of a given fossil. So relative dating, uh, index fossils, these are fossils that only existed for a short period of time, but they were widespread. And if you find uh, these index fossils in a rock layer, uh, remember rock layers are called strata, then you know that this rock layer is a certain uh, age because it has that uh, index fossil in it. Again, this is a review of what you learned in uh, earth science. Also with that, remember um, how layers are laid down. So this layer is going to be older than this layer. All right, remember that from earth science. Absolute dating. Again, this is something you learned in uh, earth science. Absolute dating, also referred to as radioactive dating. You use radioactive isotopes to determine the exact age uh, of a fossil, and we look at half-lives. So carbon-14. Carbon-14, remember, is something that uh, we use to uh, determine the age of relatively young fossils. And carbon-14, if you remember from Earth science, the half-life of that is 5,730 years. So by determining the amount of carbon-14 that is present and comparing that to a chart, then we can know the exact age of fossil. For example, you should have learned this in earth science. Here is basically the rate of decay for carbon-14. So if you find a fossil that has basically 50% carbon-14 in it, then you know that it is 5,730 years old because it takes that much time for half of the sample uh, basically to decay. If you find a sample that has 25%, then you know that it is... Um, what, 11,400 years old because uh, it's two half-lives have passed. Uh, the problem with fossil evidence, the problem is is that we don't always find uh, 
uh, fossils. Remember in earth science, the, um, the remains have to be deposited in an area that is conducive uh, for fossils to be preserved. If it's uh, if the organism dies in an area that doesn't allow for the fossil to the for the remains to basically pre be preserved, then uh, those uh, remains are going to be lost in the fossil record. So if you see here on the screen, you have a uh, dolphin that was forty seven hundred million years ago, and then this one, and then this one. So there's some gaps in between. What happened? Uh, in the evolution of uh, this dolphin. So there's some things that we're missing in between steps as the species uh, evolves. Geographical distribution of fossils. So in earth science, you learn the idea of plate tectonics and the idea of continental drift, that uh, these plates are moving and that the continents have moved uh, in earth's history. So the placement of these fossils. Uh, you'll find fossils that are only found basically in this part of South Africa and this part, or sorry, South America, not South Africa, this part of South, Amer South America and then this part of Africa. And it makes sense that you would find fossils in these locations because at one time in Pangaea, they would have been together. So uh, where we find these fossils are also used to support the idea of um, evolution because now all right you have bird species that were here and here but now they're separated so now you end up with uh, two species um, that are different than one another because now they're in different locations and exposed to different environmental conditions so they're going to change uh, over time so here is the mesosaurus again a fossil that you only found only find in South America and Africa and it makes sense that you would find them in those locations because if, if you look at the uh, pieces this looks like it would fit right here. DNA evidence. All right this is the third piece of evidence that scientists use to support the idea of evolution. So in a lab we are going to compare the amino acid sequence for uh, different organisms and how many differences there are determines how closely related uh, a species is to one another and you're going to see that in a lab that we're going to do. So uh, again if you notice that uh, amino acid sequence the differences between uh, the amino acids and hemoglobin all right for humans and a gorilla the difference is only one but compared to a uh, mouse, we have 27. So we are more closely related to gorilla or to gorillas than we are to mice, right? And that is simply because of the number of differences. So the lesser the number of differences, the more closely related we are uh, to an organism. And uh, the more differences there are, the less related we are to them. Anatomical evidence. So scientists use anatomical features to support the idea of evolution. If you look at these two organisms, they do have structures that look like each other. All right, you have a red panda and you have um, the panda that we typically think of. But you might think that this is related to a raccoon because if you look at a raccoon's features, they look similar. Um, so anatomical features can be... Um, uh, deceiving because if I were to say I would say this is probably related to a raccoon more so than it is related to a panda so the use of DNA evidence has allowed scientists to determine how closely related organisms are to one uh, another and not just rely on uh, anatomical evidence to support the idea that they have basically descended uh, from common ancestors Homologous structures. Homologous structures are the uh, anatomical features that scientists look at. So homologous structures are structures that have similar anatomy. Uh, if you look at, these are basically the forelimbs of four different uh, organisms. So this is the forelimb of a human. This is the forelimb of a cat, a whale, and a bat. If you look at the bones that make them up, you will notice that they have the same bones. The humerus the radius, the ulna, uh, 
the carpals, the metacarpals, the phalanges. It's the arrangement of those bones that makes the function different for the organisms. So whales, they swim. So they have very long phalanges to allow them to have those flippers. All right, bats, same thing. They're going to have phalanges, very long phalanges uh, in order to help them fly. Cats, they walk on their feet. So notice the structure of their phalanges. All right, humans, our bones are like this. But because they have the same makeup, the same bones are found in all four of these organisms' forelimbs, it indicates that they did at one time share a common ancestor. So homologous structures are anatomical structures that are used to indicate that organisms uh, come from common ancestors. Vestigial structures. Vestigial structures are basically structures that uh, an organism has that has lost its function over time. And they give some clues about um, what uh, was present or what the lifestyle of that organism was. So humans, we do have a vestigial structure. It is our appendix. Um, and this is the uh, appendix here. Uh, we do not use our appendix now. And it is believed to be vestigial because it was much larger uh, than it was in, in early humans that you see. Um, but now it's very small. And if we uh, get an appendicitis and it has to be removed, it's no big deal because it doesn't play a role for us. So the early humans on Earth, all right, they had to basically forage for uh, the food that they ate. So they ate a lot of nuts and berries. And it is believed that the appendix help uh, basically process um, nuts and berries and things like that. Today... Very few nuts and berries do we eat. We eat uh, stuff that we've grown or um, livestock that we've killed and things like that. So our stomach doesn't need the appendix to process those much harder things to eat. So over time, we've lost the basically the usefulness of an appendix. So vestigial structure are structures that remain in an organism and gives clues to uh, kind of the past of an organism, if you will. An example of a vestigial structure is um, what you see here in a snake. If you turn a snake over, you will see what looks to be like these little structures here. They are believed to be reduced hind legs, so evidence that uh, at one point snakes had hind legs. Another example of a vestigial structure is in whales uh, and dolphins and things like that. They have what appears to be uh, hip bones, which would indicate at some point uh, they were able to uh, have legs and walk. But because they uh, become better swimmers, then they didn't need legs. So over time, basically, they, they lost those structures. But there is evidence that at one point uh, they were able to walk. All right, another piece or another part uh, of the puzzle is embryology. So embryology is another piece of evidence used to support the idea of evolution. So if you study how uh, the different organisms' embryos develop and look how close, closely they um, resemble one another, it indicates um, common ancestry. So notice here that you have... Uh, all of these organisms, and these are the early stages of the embryos, and then as they develop, you can see the changes uh, in the embryo as they develop. So scientists, um, we know that uh, basically life began in the ocean. That is the belief because it was much more uh, stable, much more stable environment than it would have been on land. Um, so scientists look at the developing embryos and. Uh, use that as proof, basically, that we all came from or, uh, life that started in the ocean. Because if you notice, all of the organisms, even humans, have uh, gill slits in early stages of development. And then, as you can see, all right, fish and salamanders, their stages of embryologic development are similar. And that makes sense because they both live in uh, a aquatic environment. Uh, tortoises and chicks, all right, they are both reptiles. If you look at their stages of embryolo uh, embryological development, they are similar to one another. Again, that makes sense because they're both amniotes. They both come from uh, an egg. A rabbit and a human. If you look at our embryological 
uh, stages of development, you will notice that they are similar to one another. And again, that makes sense because we are both mammals. So by looking at how the embryos develop, you can um, say which organisms are more closely related to each other as well. So evolution today, there are two main theories basically as to how evolution uh, takes place. One is gradualism and that implies that evolution is a slow steady process. You see slow uh, changes in a population over time and then the other one is basically what we would call uh, punctuated equilibrium. Basically that organisms show uh, no change and they kind of they're kind of stable but because of a uh, rapid change in the environment then you see sudden change uh, in that population followed by more long periods of stability because maybe um, that sudden change in environment has now become the norm so there's no pressure to evolve anymore so then you see uh, basically uh, long periods of stability so this is a picture representation of the two so notice here on the left, gradualism, you see these very slow changes in the butterfly uh, population. Whereas in punctuated equilibrium, you see basically no change, and then all of a sudden you see kind of this rapid change. So there's two uh, models as to how uh, population, how evolution can happen uh, in a population, gradualism versus punctuated equilibrium equilibrium. Gradualism, very slow changes, slow steady changes, and punctuated equilibrium where there's no change, all of a sudden you see a change, and then again periods of no change because now the environment or whatever has become stable again. That's the basics of uh, Darwin's theories of evolution, the support, uh, the evidence for that. Uh, we will continue our discussion in the last video on evolution. Uh, that's it for now. Have a great day. Bye.